and I have been doing a fat monitoring research out there. Clay Hill Memorial Course is where I've been doing the research. We have a lot of different research projects out there. Um, so a little bit about Clay Hill first, it's a 305 acre property. One of its biggest key characteristics is that it's actually nested within five different ecoregions. And so that really helps with the variance. We get a lot of different species because there's a lot of different habitats right around it. Um, there's also a maternity colony of gray bats. I've recorded gray bats. The significance of it is that they're actually endangered. Um, the first time we, we recorded them was last year during the summer. So we got really excited about that. So we have a maternity colony of them about 10 miles off the site. Um, so this kind of helps uh, give us confidence that we did actually get gray bat. This is a map of Clay Hill and actually right around Taylor County. Um, Clay Hill is of course a zoomed in area on the picture. And this is another close up. That yellow dot is where my bat recorder was. It actually fell um, a couple months ago. So we had to repair it because it did get cracked on the screen. Um, so we actually got it repaired and we're going to be putting it to a new site. That's where it was previously built. And here is a map of the five different ecoregions. There's the area around Clay Hill. Um, so we're nested right in the center of it. We're not in just one specific ecoregion. We got a lot of different ones around it. At the top right of that map is the bluegrass. So we're getting a lot of different Kentucky specific species. Uh, the reason we started this was for bio inventory for Kentucky Heritage Land Fund. They have funded all of our research out of Clay Hill and in fact have helped fund getting more property for Clay Hill. One of the requirements to fund us was to do bio inventory. And they asked us to just see what species we have for their information in their catalogs. So first we just wanted to know what we had. Now after having four years of monitoring, we are in our fourth year in 2017. I've been doing it since uh, 2015 in the fall. Um, we've had four years now monitoring. We've collected 30,000 different calls. We've had a lot, a lot, a huge database. So now we have all these calls. We kind of know what species we have. So the next step further is using analysis. Um, the, the recorder has been at four different sites. Like I said, it fell, so it's going to be moved to a fifth site. And as I said, we've had thousands of this is the recorder I have. It's exactly what it looks like, but mine has a really big mic at the bottom. Uh, there's a heavy chain that holds it to the pulley system up in the tree. Thankfully, when it fell, that chain is so heavy, it, it's top heavy. So when it fell, it pulled the top down so the mic did not break. So we still have the mic intact, thank goodness. And the audio file filter I use is kaleidoscope. Uh, the recorder was 65 feet up in the tree. I did not climb the tree. Um, we actually have a pulley system. Uh, one of our, uh, there's a neighbor that lives nearby who's been helping us with all of our research projects. He's very intuitive. He actually created this big slingshot and we actually shoot the rope up over the branch so we can get it over. There's no injuries involved and we are able to get that, that recorder from the tree safely. The files are uploaded twice a week, once on Monday, once on Friday if weather permits it. And as I said, analysis is using kaleidoscope, set it recommendation from the United States Fish and Wildlife and the Indiana Bat Monitoring. What Kaleidoscope does, it actually slows down the calls to 1 20th of their speed. We can't hear bats, um, and so this slows it down to where I can actually see it on the sonogram and to hear it. This is the, the setup that I have for my pulley system. On the left is kind of what you would see when you're walking in the woods, you come across it, that's what it looks like. And on the right, you can barely see it, so I had it circled is the actual bat monitor. And these are close up to the same thing. The silver clip just holds the ropes together so it doesn't fall off the wheel. This is another thing that our neighbor invented was this neat little uh, wheel contraption uh, for the pulley system down the bottom. The red clip that's to the left of the wheel is what keeps it fastened. I just undo that and you can raise it, lower it as you need to. These are just some pictures of what I do when I go out, that's my mentor, Dr. Gordon Weddle. Um, this is actually the first uh, semester that I went out. So he went with me the first couple times to make sure that I could actually raise and lower the recorder. It was pretty heavy. Um, so now I go out on my own. 
Uh, so you take it down and you got to replace the batteries. They last about a week, so if I can't get out there one day, it'll. I might miss a day or two of recording, but it's, it, it holds a pretty good charge in it. I also have to replace the SD card. We have two separate colors because sometimes I can mix up. So uh, you have to replenish the SD card. And then that's me using Kaleidoscope. It, it actually filters out the noise files. We don't just pick up back calls. It picks up anything that's uh, supersonic. And so we're, we get, I call them forest sounds. We get trees that are creaking. If there was a thunderstorm, we might catch something from there. Cows, actually, sometimes you'll pick up. Owls, insects. So these are all sounds that I'm not using. So when I go to Kaleidoscope and I put in my sound files, I set it to Kentucky Bats. Um, and so it takes any sounds or calls or some of, some of it's just crackling, um, it takes those out and it just gives me the back calls. And so everything else is just noise. Uh, the IDs of each call, the probability for me to use it, I, wait, I use ones that are less than 0 .001. And the reason I do that is if it's any higher than that, it's from zero, it takes a range of zero to one. The closer it is to one, the less likely it is that it's even there. So I try to get it as close to zero as I can. Those are the only ones that I use for my analysis. Those are the ones that we were most confident were positively identified as what they say it was. They're then added to the compilation of my whole database. This is actually Zach Kell. She's a bat specialist in Kentucky. I gave a bat presentation a couple months ago, and he was present. Uh, so he actually, we have one big brown in one of our shelters on the property. It actually nests right in the roof. So he came out and he certified to handle them. Uh, he has special gloves too. So he came out and was actually able to bring the bat down so we could all take a look at it. That's a close up of the big brown bat. So the whole reason, um, like why would I even do this, uh, like I said, is for species. But I also, for the analysis, it gets a little bit more specific to discriminate between the species. Um, the first thing I learned when I started doing this project was that I thought all bats just gave the same call. What I didn't realize is it's based on species. Each species gives a different kind of call. And you can tell on the sonogram the shape of it and characteristics are species specific. But I needed to prove that with analysis. And also another reason I did this is for seasonal migration and hibernation. I have not touched on that too much yet. I'm still in the uh, second stage of just dis discriminating the species. But the next thing I'm going to do is start doing migration and hibernation patterns. This is just a list of species we can confident, confidently say that we have identified out at Clay Hill. The last two are very important. They're endangered is the little brown bat and the gray bat. There are two other uh, myotis. They're in the genus myotis. Most myotis bats are endangered. There are two other myotis that we might have gotten, but their probabilities weren't very good. We didn't get enough calls, so we cannot confidently say that they were actually there. These are some distinctive sonograms. Just something you'd see when you pull it up on the computer after kaleidoscope does its filtering. So you're given the amplitude on the top, and you have your frequency on the bottom. Uh, the gray bat and the gray bat are very distinctive. Usually when you see those come up, you, you almost automatically know what it is. Gray bat is like an S shape. It's got that little dip at the end. And the hoary bat is very low frequency. Humans can hear for about 200 hertz to about 18,000 hertz, depending on how good your hearing is. Everybody's different. The hoary bat actually gives a frequency between 10 and 15. So you might be able to hear like a click. You can actually hear bat calls. Like I said, they're supersonic. But with a hoary bat, you might just hear a click. With my analysis to do discriminant and multivariate, I use SysBat 13 and Sigma, Sigma Plot 13.0. These are two uh, statistical programs to discriminate the species. Um, it's very hard to grasp multiple variables. Um, the average person might be able to grasp three, four, possibly five. Um, I can probably do up to four on a graph. So I have about 11 different variables that I have to keep in mind when I'm discriminating these species. You have frequency, different characteristics of the species, the duration, 
many different variables. And so I cannot mentally hold on to all 11. So these statistical pro programs have multivariate options that I can put in these variables. It can use canonical scores, plot, and multivariate discriminant analysis in order to give me a visual of the variance between the species. And this is an example. On the bottom right is actually abbreviations of the bat species. It's based on scientific name. Um, and I actually have just gotten used to using the common, the common name. And I just uh, stick bat to the abbreviation. So the red in the middle is the big brown bat. The green on the left is the gray bat. And the blue on the right is the hoary bat. This is one of the first graphs I did. I use these three because the big brown has a pretty average frequency for bats. The gray bat has a very high frequency because it's in the biotis genus. And the hoary bat has a very low frequency. And so I did this just to kind of get a feel for how this program worked, see if I could even get a difference. The line I inserted just to illustrate how you can almost draw a line between them to see a difference. If they were all the same, there'd be no bunching up, there'd be no grouping. It would kind of be all uh, interconnected. There'd be no difference. So this is what I'm looking for when I'm using uh, multivariate discriminant analysis, is just trying to find differences in groupings and clear separation between species. And this sort of canonical scores plot, at first it was very hard for me to even understand what was going on here. It's still kind of confusing and I'm still learning more about it. It actually has about nine variables in this graph right now, and it's only showing two. And what this actually does, or how it simplified, is it takes these variables and tries to find if any variables are saying the same thing, um, like frequency, they might be saying the same thing. So there's no reason to keep putting it in. And so it actually narrow it down. Some cases I've heard it actually creates its own variable. So another part of my research is just trying to fully understand exactly how this works. I sometimes use scatter plots. As I said, we can grasp at least three variables. So you have your z-axis, your y, and your x. And using this, this is when I insert the, whatever variables I wish to look at. I try to make sure they're different. In this one, just for demonstration, I have frequency, the average frequency on the y or the z-axis, and the frequency of the knee, which is the middle of the call, on the x-axis. They're both frequency, so you're going to get a linear transgression there that's positive. And I did that on purpose just for demonstration's sake and also the durations of the call. And on this graph, you have your big brown, which is red, the eastern red, which is actually blue, and the tricolor bat, which is the green. So this also shows a little bit of separation. So as I said, if they were all the same, then they would all be bunched together and there'd be no clear uh, discrimination between them. So even with a graph like this, you still start to see separation. Of course, we all have we all have issues with our research. I'm sure all of us have come across that. Um, so one of mine, as I mentioned, Zach Couch was present when I gave a presentation. It was for high school students, so I was going into different bat species, what they're like, and I had included the Townsend's Big Eared. Because we had gotten enough of their calls and the probability, the probability was decent, so I included them. Afterwards, he came up to me and he said, I loved your presentation, but you probably did not have Townsend's Big Eared. So then I had to go back and, okay, if we don't have this, then why are we getting so many? So my solution was to look at alternative tags. So if it wasn't this one, it gives you an alternative of what it might have been if that was not it. So to look at those, see if there's a similarity, and also to do what I've been doing with the discriminant analysis is to see if there's any characteristics of the calls that are similar to another species that we have. So this is my aha moment in my research, is I was able to find this graph. I put in, I looked at their database, and I found that all the Townsend's big ear, which is uh, represented as the red, and um, I looked at all the alternative tags, and it was always saying big brown or eastern red. So now I had two, at least two other species that it could have been. So I put all three in, and it gave me this clear separation. I tried different graphs, and the Townsend's big ear was constantly with the big brown. So um, with a decent amount of confidence, I can say that they were more than likely misidentified big brown calls. 
maybe they had uh, characteristics that were just off enough, maybe you thought it was something else, but um, this was the graph that I had to illustrate that. And I would also, of course, like to give a special recognition to uh, my mentor, Dr. Gordon Weddle. C.R. Westmoreland was actually the graduate who had started this program back in 2014. I picked it up from her, and I've also included her back calls in my analysis, and we have four years of back calls. Zach Couch, who actually came out, helped me with the Townsend Big Year, Kentucky Heritage Land Fund, Playhome Memorial Forest, and of course, our Campbell's Lake University. Thank you. question from a chemist's point of view, why do bots call? I don't, I don't know this. Like, oh, okay, so why, why do they call? Yeah. Um, for multiple purposes, sometimes for mating, they might use calls, I guess similar to birds, but it's supersonic. Uh, to find food is another one. They use their it's a echolocation, it's a supersonic call, similar to dolphins, uh, to find their, their uh, insect prey, and also just to uh, navigate. They're very good at navigating, and so at night, they use their calls and using the echo, they can hear around objects and stuff. So how much difference is there, I mean, between one bat of a species and another? Is, can you, is this something you're going to be able to use to tell apart and actually get a number of how many bats by, you know, subtle variations? Um, bat like, accents. Like for individual bats or just species in general? Well, within, you're, we're really concerned you're talking about the grey bats. So is there a way you can use this to get a rough idea of how many different gray bats? Um, I have not been able to do individuals yet, um, like to get a number. Yeah. I'm not able to do that yet. I can say that we have had gray bat, but I cannot say for sure yet how many exactly we have. But that would be an interesting way to expand it, would be to do that, yes. How many calls on average do you get in a monitoring um, frame, like over a week? It depends on the season because if they're hibernating, we don't get any during winter unless there's one that might be out. Um, but like when they're out, like during spring, I mean, there's been times between Monday and Friday I come in and I got 400 calls already. So it just depends on the season. We get a lot of big brown. I have majority of this is big brown. It's very common. So it also depends on just what month it is. Um, you just mentioned you don't get many calls during hibernation. When you do get calls, is that evidence of white nose syndrome? Because I saw you had tricolors on there, which are really under a lot of pressure. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's actually one thing that I've been interested in is touching on a white nose syndrome. It's possible that that's something where an animal came in and disturbed it, or a disease like white nose syndrome could be that. Because there have been times that we've gotten, it's not a lot, it's not like a significant amount, but we might get one. So yes, it, it could be evidence of that, yes. Can, can you go back to like the, the first distinction plot where you, uh, that you had two lines drawn on it? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, the green, there's actually like two little clusters. Is that two distinctive calls of the same bat? Or like there's the one green cluster right in the middle of the red, um, and then there's the green cluster over the That's a good question. Um, each, each of those dots on there is an, is an individual call. So the clusters are just all the clusters of calls. Um, I actually saw that, that little grouping too, and I'm, uh, it's possible that maybe those were misidentified. I've noticed that when I use gray bat in graphs, there's always that little cluster that you see down in the red. So I'm not sure exactly what that little cluster is. It's possible that they were misidentified, and maybe there's some algorithm in there that's changing it. Um, but the big cluster on the left is majority of right. it. Yeah, I just wonder if there may be certain bats actually produce more than one kind of call. 
and that, that you would see. Yes, that, yeah. is, that is possible. Um, where we're moving, the recorder now is actually going to be over a spring, so a water source. We're hoping that maybe we'll get different calls if they're hunting. 